Hi, uh, this is Jack Stanley, and uh, I want to do a little talk with a few books on John Quincy Adams. Now, I don't know if all of you know who John Quincy Adams was. I would imagine you would. Most people who understand history, of course, will be very much immersed in the history of John Quincy, because Few people in the history of this country have been so involved in it. In fact, he was involved in service to his country from the age of 10. And he was in service with his country until the age of 80, at the time of his death. John Quincy Adams is nothing short of incredible in many respects. He was his father's secretary uh, in France, and he met everyone. He was tutored by Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, his own father. He was there in the Age of Enlightenment in France. The king of uh, France at the time, of course, was, you know, Louis the Sixteenth. And, of course, France would eventually come to our aid during our revolution. He traveled with his father at the age of 10, going across the Atlantic in a hostile environment. The ship they were on was attacked. They went through all kinds of various issues and problems. He traveled all over Europe as a secretary, as a translator. And this is before he's like 14 years old. Amazing, amazing story. Now, of course, as time goes on, uh, he becomes a ambassador, a diplomat, an educator, a senator, a congressman, a president. Um, there wasn't much more that he could possibly do if you think about it. Well, I have to throw in a few more things. He was a poet, a philosopher, and an author. That really covers pretty much everything there. And, and the amazing thing about John Quincy Adams is he was constantly trying to find ways of advancing himself, of re-educating himself, and um, finding interesting and fascinating ways, fascinating ways to bring about great changes for the country for which he lived. I must say that he became one of the great champions against slavery. In fact, when he was a lowly congressman in the later years of his life, he was on a pretty much one-man crusade to fight slavery. He received death threats. Uh, he was, he was uh, propositioned with censure, which being removed from the house, he said, go ahead, try. <laughs> and he would intellectually debate with the house and win. Amazing man. I mean, we're talking about an intellect that is so vast, it's hard to comprehend. He spoke... I believe it was eight languages, and wrote in eight languages, and read, and I believe more. Um, his library was extensive, and his outreach, his work, was nothing short of incredible. Have you heard of the Monroe Doctrine? Guess who wrote it? John Quincy, getting Florida into the Union. Guess who worked on that? John Quincy. He taught at Harvard. He was president in a very unsuccessful term. In fact, probably the most unsuccessful John Quincy Adams ever was, was his president. And there's reasons for that. But his research, his work, his amazing output is nothing short of incredible. So let's talk a little bit about this fella as I've given you this preamble, which is already an amazing resume, which is, in many cases, if I may say so, unequaled by almost anyone else in our history. 
Now, he started at the age of about 10, keeping a diary. It might have been a little younger, it might have been a little later, I'm not sure. And he kept that up for almost all of his life. That's been a great inspiration for me because I have kept a diary uh, since I was a teenager and I am still filling out. I'm on my like 41st, no, I'm on my 50th book, come to think of it, in writing and keeping uh, track of events and things like that. It's an amazing thing, and the interesting thing, which I'm sure John Quincy did as well, is I find I disagree with myself all the time, because I felt very differently at different periods of my life. And it's a fascinating thing to, to look through your history and, and discover how you felt at one time, and discover how differently you felt at a later time. Now, as I mentioned, he was a teacher. And he taught um, a wonderful series of, uh, of uh, lectures. Um, and I have his uh, book right here I want to share with you. This dear thing's very delicate. It's, it's 214 years old, so it's getting up there in its age. But these are his lectures. given at Harvard University. And the interesting thing was, it's chock-filled of fascinating and interesting knowledge. These were his lectures on rhetoric and oratory, uh, delivered to uh, the classes of seniors and juniors at Harvard University. He uh, did two years at Harvard, and then he was requested by President James Madison to become an ambassador, I believe, in Russia at that time. And so he had to leave Harvard, and his students, um, who were very enamored with him, asked if he could publish his lectures, which he did, which was a series of books. There's two of them here, and I have lots of little notes inside for things that are written, not totally dealing with John Quincy, but for the owner of these books. You know, once again, it's, it's really a fascinating thing when you look at a book and you have a book and you go through it and you don't know its history or where it has been. And then suddenly you discover something within the book that suddenly makes you have what we call an aha moment. And that happened just a few years ago. It was the year 2020. And as you all know, in the year 2020, we were in the midst of a pandemic. And so I was at home, couldn't go anywhere, couldn't do anything. So I was going through books. And I was looking at these books, which I had had for about 15 years previous. And I was so excited because they were written by John Quincy Adams. And I couldn't figure out, there was some writing in the front. And I didn't quite understand what it said. Until finally, I was looking at it. Let me just take one of the books because it would be a lot easier. I was looking at it. And I happened to look. And I said, what does that say? And then it finally struck me. It said, William Smith. And I said, wait a minute. I know a William Smith. William Stephen Smith was John Quincy's brother-in-law. He married uh, Abigail Adams, the younger, uh, and... Uh, she became Abigail Smith, and he had an amazing history. He was involved in the American Revolution, of course, and he fought in almost all of the battles. He became Lafayette's aide-de-camp, and he was sort of like in that area with George Washington, and eventually he became George Washington's aide-de-camp. 
and he became very important to Washington during the last days of the Revolution. Uh, he was in charge of what we call Evacuation Day in New York City. And uh, when the Washington administration started, he was very much involved with that. Uh, he was involved with the Society of Cincinnati, Cincinnati, excuse me, I think, or Cincinnati, excuse me, that's right. And that was in New York with, with all of the, the uh, revolutionary soldiers. Then he became John Adams' secretary in England. And then, of course, he married John Adams' daughter. Meanwhile, he became very friendly with Thomas Jefferson. And he used to go back and forth between France and London, bringing messages. And Jefferson always wrote, there's a room always ready for Mr. Smith. And they became very friendly. And then they came back. Uh, he got into land speculating, which some people were doing, and some people were very successful. He was not. And it led to a major serious problem. And then he had some falling outs with several different things, was involved in a, in a highly secretive raid that many think was uh, devised by Thomas Jefferson, but there's, there's lots of questions on that. And unfortunately, after that, his life was not too good. I will say that he did eventually become a congressman and then died in 1816. And these were his books. I think about this. This is a guy who knew everybody. You know, he was friends with Aaron Burr. He knew Alexander Hamilton. He knew everybody. And of course, he used to share a tent with George Washington. And George Washington used to have him come and his wife come for dinner every week with he and Martha when he was president, at least when they were in New York. It's pretty amazing. And these were John Quincy Adams books. And there's that fantastic connection. As I said, a lot of times with books, the amazing thing sometimes is who owned them. And so I've been going through this and I'm finding marginalia put in by William Stephen Smith. And so this is helping me understand him because there's not a great deal of research. And most of the research out these days is extremely negative. And there's a lot of positive things about William Stephen Smith. So it's the first books I wanted to illustrate. These books also are very important because there was a great falling out between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. And uh, Benjamin Rush of Philadelphia, the father of American psychiatry, worked so hard to get them together. In fact, he wrote a letter, and this is so incredible. I always call it the gift of prophecy, because he said, I had a dream. And he wrote a letter to John Adams saying, I had a dream that my son brought a history book to me. And he said, for the year of 1809, John Adams, you know, with great humility, you know, basically forgave Thomas Jefferson for what he considered an insult and wrote a letter to Jefferson. Jefferson was so delighted to read the letter that he wrote a letter right back. And before long, these two old patriots were writing back and forth, and these letters are prized by historians. And he went on with his dream. And these fantastic letters are prized today, and that they fell into the grave at practically the same time. This was written in 1809, by the way. It took a little longer than 1809. It was 1812, January 1st, when John Adams wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson. And in that letter, he said, I'm going to send you some homespun. What was the homespun? Copies of these books. That's pretty amazing. And of course, if you think about it, <laughs> his dream became fact that they did write to each other. And those letters are prized by historians. And they did fall into the grave at practically the same time. It was the very same 
day, July the 4th, 1826. And to add to the whole story, it was the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. You know, if I made up a story and I threw all of these coincidences in, no one would believe it. But it's true. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Benjamin Rush's letter was prophecy. And here's the amazing part of it all. As soon as the relationship with Jefferson and Adams was together, Benjamin Rush died. And his death solidified their relationship. Truly a gift of prophecy. One of the greatest in the history of the United States. Lots of people wrote about uh, John Quincy. Getting back to him because uh, we got a little sideline there with uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, which, once again, you know, John Quincy Adams studied a lot with Thomas Jefferson. He studied a lot with Benjamin Franklin. Think of this education. He met with all of the leaders of Europe. He was educated in Europe. His wife was from Europe. Um, interesting things. And, of course, he was a teacher. He became the ambassador. And later he became Secretary of State under James uh, Monroe. And, of course, he did incredibly... In fact, many people consider him the greatest Secretary of State we've ever had. And if we think about the Monroe Doctrine, it was the John Quincy Doctrine, to be honest. He wrote the whole thing pretty much. And of course, after that, he ran for president, and it was ugly. He ran against Andrew Jackson, and nobody had a plurality. It went to Congress, and uh, it was somewhat shady. I, I won't deny that. But uh, John Quincy Adams, through Henry Clay's assistance, became president, and Adams immediately made Henry Clay his Secretary of State. In those days, becoming Secretary of State was like a stepping stone to the presidency. And so that was a really horrible time when he was president, and let's just go right by it because there's not much to talk about. And then the presidency ends because he runs for re-election and is totally destroyed by Jackson. And he goes back to the old house uh, in Quincy. And he figures he'll spend his last days doing what his father did, being a farmer. But people came up to him and said, we need you. And he became a lowly congressman. And he started all over again. And his greatest days were in Congress. Because the interesting thing about it is that he took on things that nobody else wanted to because he wasn't afraid to. Sometimes people, he was not known for having a great personality at times. He was great after he had a couple of drinks, <laughs> to be honest. He and Dolly Madison used to sit there and get a snootful, and then they were just the best people to hang around with. And they'd play cards, and she'd, snuff, uh, she'd sniff snuff, and he'd have drinks, and they would tell jokes and stories, sometimes with Daniel Webster. And uh, that must have been a great time. I would have loved to have seen that. Dolly Madison was a hoot, I tell you. Uh, historically. I hope they do some... I'd love to see somebody do a history about some of the stuff and just show the lighter side of it. You know, we always make things extremely serious. But you know something? The most important thing in life is to laugh a little bit. And every one of these people had their time laughing. And we should talk about it. Lots of books were written about John Quincy. This was written by Joshua Quincy, a relative. It's very kind to him, of course. And it's fascinating reading. Yeah, I'll show it to you. You know, it's got this little thing in the front with this picture. And this was written, let me see what year was this written. It was like 1850-something, wasn't it? This is 1860, excuse me. And it's the life of John Quincy Adams. 
Great book. Fascinating reading. And now comes the best book of all. One of the people that was very close to John Quincy Adams in Congress was a fellow by the name of William Seward. Maybe you've heard of him. Well, Seward was uh, one of the founders of the new Republican Party. But he had been, you know, a Whig before that time. As did another fellow by the name of Abraham Lincoln, who had one ser uh, term in Congress, uh, not exceedingly popular, um, was totally against the war, the Mexican-American War, which we will talk about in the future. And uh, John Quincy was near Lincoln, and Seward was there, and, and John Quincy Adams fought tooth and nail against slavery. You had something in Congress in those days called the gag rule. And what did the gag rule mean? Very simply, it gagged the whole message or conversation or subject of slavery. We're not talking about it. And so we kind of put our heads in the sand like an ostrich. If we can't see it, can't hear it, doesn't bother us. And that's what they were kind of doing. It was, it was a big problem. And so every day, <laughs> John Quincy Adams would come into Congress and have a petition to save certain, certain slaves and, and people that were in bondage. And, and the South would go nuts. And for a while, the Speaker of the House was James K. Polk, who kept calling John Quincy Adams that damn old man. And lots of people got really upset. He used to receive all kinds of death threats and pictures sent to him, you know, stabbed with blood or hanging from a noose and stuff like that. And as he got older, he got more adventurous and more involved in killing slavery. Now, he kind of knew he wasn't going to live to see it, but boy, did he mention lots of things that are really quite fascinating. He said, when the time comes, and he says, I do believe there will be a civil war. And he said, when that happens, the way you free the slaves is you make it a War Powers Act. People were listening. His friend, William Seward, was listening very carefully. Now, you know who William Seward was and what William Seward would become. He would become the Secretary of State to Abraham Lincoln. And so all of the ideas of John Quincy Adams and the whole thing with the, the you know, the, the, the Emancipation Proclamation, the Proclamation of Emancipation, whichever way you want to put it, um, is is right from right from the brain of John Quincy Adams. And he talked about lots of things like this. And William Seward learned an awful lot. And for that one term in Congress, Abraham Lincoln was in there with John Quincy Adams too. Very important. There's an awful lot of influence from John Quincy Adams in the Lincoln administration much more so than people realize. And here's the interesting thing about the book, the last thing I want to show. And that is, this is the book on John Quincy Adams, but if you look carefully, it's written by William Seward, his friend. And it's a, it's a great book. I've read it and enjoyed it. And there's a great deal of respect um, given by Seward to John Quincy Adams. Now, one last thing I want to mention about Adams, and that is in his fight against slavery. In 1844, after years of fighting, he finally killed 
the gag rule. The fights in Congress were intense. And in fact, there was a great battle where several of the Southern congressmen were all debating with Adams and he was by himself and defeating them. I mean, it was incredible. And they would sit there and say, we will destroy you. And he would answer, good. <laughs> so, I mean, it was really amazing. I would have loved to have seen that. And I think that this energized the old boy and he couldn't wait for another battle. And so he also had another great battle that we know about sometimes, but we forget about. There was a ship called the Amistad that was basically taken over by the slaves that were on it, and they ended up on an American shore, and they were held. And they declared their freedom. And it was a very difficult battle that took place. They were basically imprisoned. Everyone came to John Quincy Adams and he took the case and he spoke before the Supreme Court for nine hours and he gave a master class on understanding man understanding liberty, understanding that all men are created equal, that if that document exists that says we're all equal, you know, if it isn't true, then we can't follow it, you know. And remember, Abraham Lincoln will follow that same route of John Quincy Adams using the Declaration of Independence for much of his argument, just like Adams. Just think of the Gettysburg Address, four score and seven years ago. That's the Declaration of Independence. So this man got them off and they were freed. One of the great pleasures in my life and an emotional one to a degree, was going to John Quincy Adams' private library and being able to see the Bible that was given to him by the Amistad slaves. They couldn't write. It's a series of X's. That's their signature to say thank you. That's very, very powerful. And uh, John Quincy Adams was very, very happy about that, that he was able to do that. And that also he received a cane with the date of the death of the gag rule in 1844. He started failing, had a stroke, came back, and when he came back, it was 1847, everybody in that house realized that this was the last link to Washington, to Franklin, to Jefferson, and to his father. That here was a man who had been in service of his country since the age of 10. And here at the age of 80, he was spending his last days. He was totally against the Mexican-American War. He said it's stupid and it's an invasion. It's he went on and on. I got very upset about it. And uh, the one thing that upset him so much was the Mexican-American War. And there was a roll call in 1848, early in February. And they wanted to give awards to various people from the war. And he rose up and said, no. And then he had a stroke and collapsed. He was carried into the speaker's room, laid onto a couch. And then for two and a half days, he slowly entered the world that you don't return from. He awoke one time or twice. And supposedly he said, tis the end of earth, but I am composed. 
He was known as Old Man Eloquent, and he was eloquent to the end. This country owes an awful debt to John Quincy Adams. I don't think he gets it very often. And whenever I have a book or have something around me that I know he was around, that just gets that respect button flying high. Lincoln felt it. Seward felt it. And the nation at the end of the American Civil War felt everything that John Quincy Adams did because Lincoln and Seward followed him. Thank you.